Greetings, this is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan and Rockefeller Center. Newsstand Studios, joined as usual with uh, John right behind me. How you doing, John? Doing great, thanks. Everything, everything good? Yeah, everything's peachy. You enjoying yeah. this, uh, whatever this is, this springy spring? Absolutely, yeah? yes. Oh, nice, all right. Also in the studio today, we have always Joe Hazen, rocking the panels. How you doing, Joe? Hey, thanks for joining us. <laughs> uh, uh, not in her normal place, in an undisclosed uh, location, Cheney-like. We have Nastasia Lopez. How you doing, Stas? Good. <laughs> Good. You sound so enthused to be here. I'm so so excited for you. Yeah. Uh, in oh, yeah. what? I said I'm happy to be back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, because you're you're back in uh, you're back in New York as of next week, right? Or New York ish. I'm in Connecticut. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm in right. Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. All right. uh, and in California, we got Jackie Molecules. How you doing? I'm great. Yeah, it's still raining here somehow. So let me ask you a question. Like for years, all you've wanted is rain, and now that you have it, what are you thinking? Now that you found rain, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm a transplant, so uh, that's the easiest way to spot a transplant is this other. You know, if, if someone's complaining about the rain, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I'm guilty. Yeah, all right, okay. And up there on Vancouver Island, we have our customer service extraordinaire person, Quinn. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. It's great to be introduced this week. Oh, jeez. You know what, Quinn? <laughs> the entire time on, like, you know, for those of you that don't know, like when we get on the on, you know, together beforehand. Quinn just starts needling me today out of nowhere, needling me about bringing the wrong questions last week. You know, I don't know what it is. What did I do? What did I do? You know, or as my stepfather would say, who did I kill? Who did I kill? Just let me know. Uh, and uh, today's special guest we'll introduce as normal before we start shooting the breeze is Benjamin Lore, the author of uh, the Christmas present that my wife got me this year uh, for Christmas, The Secret Life of Groceries, The Dark Miracle. Oh, is it Dark Miracle of the American Supermarket or Dark Miracle of the Supermarket writ large? American supermarket. American supermarket. But, you know, it's your show. You can, you I mean, can rename this thing. I don't think we should, like, you know, uh, I don't, it's, first of all, it's a great, it's, it's a great slug line, Dark Miracle. It, like, was that you or your editor? Oh, that was me. That was, I, that was uh, you know, it was an unpopular, unpo no one wanted miracles in the title. It was, really? It was too ostentatious and religious oh. and all, all these bad things. Um, so I'm, I'm, so I wrote a book and I'm trying to write another book and the slug line of that is supposed to be the miracle of moisture management and about five people on who, you know, are fans of that title and everyone who knows me and cares about me is like, do not call it that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's like a it summer, is. summer problem, like sweat schwitzing. Well, I like the word moisture. Yeah. Like to me, like, you know. People always hate on moisture, but like a cake is supposed, still a cake is supposed moist. to be moist. Yeah. Moist. Because maybe a cake is supposed to be vaguely gross and sexual. Maybe. Like moist implies human moistness. That's why people don't like it, right? Moist implies dampness and humidity and like crotch rot. No? Yeah, a little fungal. Mm -hmm. It's more the fungal aspects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in a cake, it's clean and good. Moister. Moisture. Because you know what people, what do people hate, John? Dry. Dry cake. Yeah, yeah. I was just complaining about that for my breakfast this morning. You had a dry, a dry cake? cake? No, it was dry pastry. Very sad. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now. Okay, okay. And, you know, Joe Hazen here, being of part Sicilian extraction, am I correct, Joe? Yes. You must enjoy a dry pastry. Um, yeah, I don't mind a dry pastry. Mm. Yeah, we have these, uh, these Sephardic cookies called tartalikus that are so dry but delicious. Yeah, I like it. But I guess what it is is that if a pastry is supposed to not be dry. Yeah, and your French pastry. A pain yeah. Raisin. Yeah. Don't want that dry. What kind of pastry? Yeah, what are we talking pain, about, John? Pain au raisin. Pain au raisin. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. Bread with raisins. <laughs> yeah, bread with raisins. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, like got a little French French pastry. It's, you know, a little like pinwheel kind of thing. It's got some, I don't know, it should be a little like custardy inside, flecked with some raisins. It's oh, delicious, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can we just say that the French do not make the best pastries? No, it's the Austrians. Of course. We, everyone we, we, knows, everyone yeah, yeah, knows this. But, Even French pastries are made better by Austrian people. Yes. You but know? French still excellent. Okay. Yeah, still very good. Okay. Yeah. But not the one you had this morning. No, no, no. Also not in France. <laughs> let me yeah. let me ask you let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Was this your fault or the baker? Was this three days ago pastry that no, you this is like this morning that I got on my way in to here. 
okay. from a storefront. Mm. Was it worse than a streetcar pretzel? Because that's to me is like the highest promise and the lowest reward. Yeah, I don't know. I it's really running on nostalgia. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you had one once <laughs> with your dad, and that was that's it. Yeah, and you have one now, and you're like, ah, the texture is bad. Everything is bad. Yeah, it's I simultaneously don't know. wet on the outside and dry in the middle. But yeah. my expectations with the good. pretzel, you know, is is to not be great. With this, I was hoping for something very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you know uh, the band King Missile? No. Uh, Oh yeah. yeah, Joe does. All right, so John, uh, yeah, so Joe knows King. So King Missile was famous for a couple I'm, of songs. Yeah. yeah, they Jesus is way cool. Uh, they what was it? Um, d- d- detachable. This is a, a technical term. It's a song quote. So even though it's a family show, detachable penis. Classic. Classic. Ding Anyway, uh, John Hall, I think, is the name of the lead singer. He also has a great song about cheesecake, where he starts driving a cheesecake truck and then eats all of the cheesecakes and then, like, basically runs away from home because he. That's it. But he's still happy. He's like the utility monster. If you know about, if you ever had a friend who's an economics major, the utility monster is someone who, like, their enjoyment stays the same regardless of how many things they consume, and so they just consume all of it, right? Okay. And he's that way with cheesecakes. Because for me, I love cheesecake, but like, you know, two slices max. This guy eats like well, a whole truck. Of cheesecakes. It's Homer Simpson-esque. It's, yeah, uh, right. Another utility monster. Anyway, so uh, he is a poet, as it turns out, and he has a book. Detachable that, penis. Say yeah, no more. Right, right. <laughs> Ob- obviously. <laughs> the amazing thing about that song is that, you know, it comes off, obviously, it's detachable, and he finds it on St. Mark's Place. This is in the 80s, and it's, you know, uh, the people used to sell things on blankets over there, which they still do in parts of the cities, but I don't think they do it there anymore. It's like a churro in yeah, the subway. Right, right. Like, detachable it, it's penis. shaped kind of like a subway churro. And what the interesting thing is, is that the guy wants too much money for it. And so he bargains him down. And I think it's amazing that you would find your own penis for sale and then bargain for it. Like, wouldn't you just pay the going rate? Maybe you've been disappointed with it your whole life. I mean, it's <laughs> like, uh, well... Anyway, do I really want this? You know, I don't know even how we got here, but I want to buy. He has a book out that I don't know whether it's any good, but I'm going to buy it for Nastasia anyway. It's called uh, The Daily Negation. And it's just a poem every day about like just negating everything. Got it. Yeah. It's like this uh, contemplate your own death, like the the death clock app. Uh, Yeah, yeah. But not even like more apathetic than that. More just like, you know, hey, why would you expect today is going to be different from yesterday? Like that kind of stuff, Got but it. like for every day, it's kind of like an antidote to people's, you know, uh, what not self help, but like, uh, you know, like those daily affirmations. Yeah, yeah. It's the exact opposite. Anchor your expectations in the streetcar pretzel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exist. That's how we Set got there. Set your day. The Set pastry. your day right there. See, Benjamin. It's, like it's going to only get better. You got to come back all the time to tell me, to, to <laughs> drop a little hint of why we were talking about something in the first place. Uh, it's a good start to the show. We can anchor expectations about yeah. me with the streetcar pretzel. Exactly. Uh, so it's only going to impress people. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Quinn or uh, or Jack, you got anything uh, good from the week? Anything? Anything? Food, food or not? Food, food adjacent, perhaps? I uh, I made this serious eats bolognese that was recommended to me via somebody in the Discord, and um, it was as delicious as advertised. Okay, so what makes this different from any other bolognese, or as uh, those uh, freaks call it? Now, in England, when they call it spag ball, do they mean bolognese, or are they talking about spaghetti and meatballs? Because like whenever they say spag ball, I just tune. I'm just like, pfft, I turn off. I can't. I can't listen. I have no idea. And anyone? <laughs> anyone know British people? You know British people. What do they mean, Joe? Bo- He's married to a Brit. Bolognese. It's Bolognese? Bolognese. Bolognese. All right. Do you co-sign that, Joe? Yeah, I have no idea. Spag ball. What the hell? Uh, all right. So what's different about this Bolognese uh, as opposed to, you know, your run-of-the-mill Bolognese? Uh, it was, it was uh, lamb, pork, beef, and then chicken livers mm. that you kind of blend up. Um, otherwise, pretty much as you'd expect. Now, here's an well, interesting fish sauce. Right? Oh, oh pancetta, pancetta too. I'm yeah, sorry, pancetta, pancetta yeah. as well. Pancetta. pancetta. Well, you know, yeah. the, chi- uh, the chicken liver is definitely the secret. Yeah. That, oh, the chicken liver. You add it to any type of bechamel, like lasagna. It is phenomenal. So here's yeah, an interesting. Here's an interesting uh, point. Um, when I was growing up listening to people read and talk about food. Now, obviously, there are many, many classic uh, sauces. My 
my uh, francophone and file friend behind me will uh, attest to ha- have liver in them. But it was widely taught when I was uh, young that adding liver to long cooked things like soups or giblet gravy would make them bitter and unpalatable. Uh, and so it's glad I'm glad to see that there is a, a turnaround on this, at least with poultry livers. You know what I mean? They, liver yeah. comeback. Yeah, liver liver comeback. I you know I think also like my generation is was one of the first generations to truly detest liver. You know, like my parents' generation tolerated it. My grandparents' generation loved it. You You're know like I mean? at the intersection of like heavy metals enter the ecosystem, consolidate in the liver. Yeah. And then you have to also eat the liver. It's yeah. like a real battery, the battery tasting liver. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also like a very huge switch in the concept of health in yeah. major to uh, – to put quotes in the same way that uh, someone will talk about in your book puts quotes on, quote, health food. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, interesting. So you like this? Uh, you like your uh, your bolognese? Yeah, it was, it was very good. All right. Okay. Very, very good. And what did you put it on? Uh, pepper dough. Okay. Mm. Okay. Did you cook it the way that uh, Katie Parla told you to cook it? What's the word she uses that sounds like chode? <laughs> Don't remember. Kyode, 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 like more hard. Oh, like extra al dente. You mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a extra yeah, I al did, dente. I did actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, as soon as yeah. she said it, in my mind, just erased what she said and put the word chode in. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and now I can't undo it. It's one of these things. It's uh-huh. gonna like you know. I'm not gonna be able to undo it. I don't know. Uh, what about you, Quinn? You got anything? Anything? Uh, I'm in a. Nice orange gelato in the creamy. It was actually interesting. I had to use, I didn't have to. I wanted to use a 10% cream from a local dairy. Well, what's a 10% cream? That's like a non, that's a yeah. non thing. Ten, what does what 10% I mean, cream was, mean? That, that was, heavy, heavy, that heavy. Was, that was their highest fat, you know, product. And I wanted to use their, their stuff. But that's like. So, yeah, I made do. Well, like, even half and half is like. 15, right? Percent fat? I don't know. That's no, weird, I, man. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'll have to look at this. You have to send me your local uh, supply. Hey, did you ever try that, the uh, olive oil yet that uh, is from uh, th- that weird little place? Was it any good? Oh, you mean the local stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. good. Okay. We got to get some to our, to our f- we have a, an oleologist. Mm. Who comes on the show periodically, uh, Benjamin? Who uh, we have to get this Where to they accredited. Be- uh, they he flies around the world and like self accredited. Well, he no he no, he's, they, got the, he's got he's all got the, the real deal. Okay, I didn't even know there was yeah. such a thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and he's called from place to place to judge things. And, oh wow! And and he okay. he takes forgive a very me, forgive me the whole oleo- yeah, yeah. oleological community. You can just uh, call him Captain Oily, but uh, <laughs> he takes umbrage when I call him Captain Greasy because he's like I deal in oil, not grease. Yes. He's very, he plays like, uh, Vegetal. he plays like Bansuri. I don't know. Like, like it's a whole thing. Anyway, he is very skeptical of anyone else's taste in olive oil other than his own. So when, when you tell him that you like something, he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? But not in a bad way. He's not trying to make you feel bad. Just wants you to know that he doesn't trust your palate. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Sure. The heft that authority. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like my art teacher used to say, he's like, you know, yes, everything is relative, but some more relative than others. Sure. Okay. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> all, right. all right. Anyone else? Uh, anyone else? Uh, you, Benjamin, do you have any good food uh, stories over oh, the past no. week? I uh, I go and I just been cooking tacos. I went to Mexico a few weeks ago, and I whenever I, I just settle into a nice rut of something extraordinarily simple uh-huh. and uh, very boring, and just make it until I slowly grow disgusted with myself for the same food item. Oh, I like that. Slowly grow disgusted with myself. Well, yeah. that kind of fits in with the tenor of your book. Yes. Yeah. Disgust. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, love and disgust. Yeah. Love and disgust together. Uh, so, <clears throat> anyway. I like, it's a, it's a better, you know, subtitle. <laughs> Who needs a dark miracle? Well, love, so. Love and disgust in the American supermarket. First of all, uh, I rarely, especially on, like, non-food books, a lot of people in, like, you know, in our orbit have read this book. Um, and it is... It's super interesting because you very specifically seem 
or you very specifically in the book, shy away from trying to be the next food Jesus. I hate food Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we share that. Yeah. And so like the fact that you kind of explicitly up front are like, hey, hey, folks, no answers here. You know what I mean? Like uh, it, it makes it a compelling read, but also <clears throat> a little bit more must have been more difficult for you. And that's probably why it took over five years of research to, to do is that it's kind of like going into this book is like jumping into an ocean that's pulling you down under. It's crazy. You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah, like, it was a downer actually by the end. I mean, there's some dark, I got into it for upbeat reasons. I, I was just curious about the supermarket. I, <laughs> I, 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 I love, I love, I go on vacation. I'll go to the grocery store. You know, I like, I like the supermarket. It's a relaxing place. Um, I browse the aisles. I feel reassured in a supermarket. But uh, the more that I, I swam in the supermarket's water, yeah, the darker it got, the more it pulled me under. Um, but uh, but yeah, I did. I I didn't want to give a false hope. I, not that there isn't hope out there. There is a lot of hope, but there aren't any tidy solutions, and there's nothing that that provides like neat answers. And so my editor was definitely banging the drum, like, let's get a final chapter with like six bullet points that s says, tell us how we're going to solve it and leave everyone with like a <laughs> uplift. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. like, not for this. Like, let's leave this bow untied. Well, but that's, I mean, that's the only way to do it. I mean, I don't know whether or not that helps or hurts sales. I mean, you can tell me, I don't know, but like in terms of like our community, and, uh, you know, like both John and I were involved, uh, one of our other things is Museum of Food and Drink. And like that's kind of where, where we get into it is that all of the people who try to provide you, quote unquote, answers fall on one side of these two extremes that you deal with quite a lot in the book, which is either like elitists who don't really understand the depth of the problem and have these pat solutions and corporate chills. And so somewhere in between these, yes. you know, like somewhere – not even in between these because it's not – there's no in between. It's not a continuum. Like somewhere it's – and the book is just like this is this is what I found. Holy crap. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, warts and all. Like let's just take a look <laughs> yeah. at this. And, and I do think solving these problems are like not that far from like solving like human nature problems. So quick fixes to like – like externalizing it is very tempting because you can recognize it. You can say that's gross. I don't want to have to deal with that. I want I want to like to think that gross things shouldn't exist in the world, but it's not that it's not that simple to solve them. I mean, they, a lot of them are motivated by our own worst qualities, and until we're willing to like do some of that work, um, but I don't know. I do go back and forth on this. There's something I think, especially in this time, there's something a little irresponsible about putting out something without any hope in it. I don't think the book has no hope. I mean, I think the tone is pretty funny and upbeat uh, at times. And, oh, it's very funny. Yeah, and there's an absurdity that I think is how I deal with the fact that we're in a, a broken world sometimes, and I think that can provide its own hope. Um, but I'm not going to lie about, you know, fi discovering some, like, solutions to huge pro macroeconomic problems. Right, but I think, you know, part of the thing that I enjoy about it is, you know, <sighs> I don't know, it's going to get deep fast, I guess, but, like, uh, you're not even mad at people who virtue signal by by like not buying Thai slave shrimp, even though at the same time you're like, yo, do you think that uh, shrimp in Honduras are being produced in any better way? You know what I mean? Uh, they're just they're not. You know what I mean? They just don't have the spotlight on them. And so you're like, at the one hand, you're like, listen, you're not necessarily a bad person. The system is designed to try to make you feel okay about the purchases you're making, and it's so complicated that. I don't know how you would even come to an opinion you could gel at the end of the book because if – it seems to me, and I don't know, the, what I got away – and I, I reskimmed it yesterday. Again, like I said, I got it as a Christmas present. And uh, my wife was like, you like this kind of subject. And it was uh, McNally Jackson's uh, yeah, yeah. what's you know staff pick or whatever. And uh, and I God support local him. I support local booksellers. God bless although you, McNally Jackson, although whatever, I love whatever McNally staff member did that. I Thank love you. McNally Jackson. However, you should buy this book at Kitchen Arts and Letters, and Quinn is going oh, to try. I love to, Kitchen Arts yeah. and Letters too. Um, they come on the show periodically and talk about. No, they're they're, and they're an institution. They're great. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, like you know. <clears throat> anyway, I'll, I'll leave it. I explain. Like, like it's just if you don't come away from it being like, oh, this is this is no. 
this is so hard, then you have missed the point of the book, right? Yes. I, I mean, so when I was doing a ton of media, when this book first came out in it's like everyone would ask like, well, what should I buy? Just tell me what I should buy. Like that would be like the last question. (laughs) And I'd be like, well, you've missed the, you've missed the point of the book. Like, I I think I grew up with that ethos, the Eric Schlosser kind of like he ends fast food nation with like, make it your own way. Burger King subverted, but like vote with your dollars. And by voting with your dollars, we're going to create this better system. And it's like, uh, I love that ethos. I grew up with it, but I think this book really points to the end of that as a, as a way of, creating change. So like, that, that book was when, like 98, 99? Exactly, exactly. And uh, it was it, it was a great book, but even at the time- oh, momentous. Like, I love that. Yeah, I mean, deeply troubling though in that way. I mean, like, I don't think the average person who wasn't studying this stuff pretty deeply kind of realized, even until after Pollen kind of became food Jesus, not to harp on him, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, even after that happened, I don't think a lot of people really kind of realized how troubling and elitist these kinds of like uh, that's right prescriptions for the future. Well, are. I think it's not an accident. I mean, I think they're intentionally elitist. You know, in the book, we I, one of the big things I go into is like trying to figure out why we buy. Like, I was really interested in the rise of the grocery store. Like, you know, with growing up in the '80s, the grocery store was this like definitionally banal chore of an activity just like long looming linoleum floors. And it was just a boring place you'd go out of obligation. And then somewhere, you know, one of the triggers for this book was going to tr- my first Trader Joe's uh, with a bunch of yogis for this book, yoga book I was writing and just watching them run through this store like kids at Disneyland. And they were just so excited by the Trader Joe's, which I'd never been in. And I couldn't quite understand how a grocery store. That could was the do first that. time you were in a Trader Joe's? First time I was in a Trader Joe's. Uh, and it was mind blowing. I was like, these are, these, these are grown adults who are like, think that this is a this is a playground um but so, i mean uh, it's funny like so in the book you talk about trader joe's specifically marketing to a certain kind of yes. person uh <clears throat> over what was it over over educated what was it over educated uh, underpaid, overeducated, underpaid, right. kind of Volvo driving professor. That's, so that's the, yoga. Uh, that's yoga too, though, that's right? Yo- oh, that was a conscious kind of pivot. I was like, I don't, I didn't want to become yoga Jesus. That was actually in my mind. I was like, I finished that book and I thought I was kind of set up. I could go on like a tour of yoga studios and hawk my little uh, insights uh, on how corrupt and, and narcissistic the Bikram world was and people would love that. But I just didn't want to be the yoga guy. I didn't, I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a a pop nonfiction writer. So, but I was like, okay, but I do have a, a little audience that I carved out in that world. Uh, uh, that book landed really heavy with the Bikram community for, for understandable reasons. And, uh, and like, who else is like, what, where is something similar? And like the, the Trader Joe's same, same as like using that as a microcosm for understanding the larger grocery industry, um, in the same way that Bikram could stand in for like uh, the the larger American uh, romanticization and a kind of obsession with yoga. So it was, it was, I was super conscious of that like parallel. Yeah. Uh, all right. So if you pick up the book, it opens with the most, first of all, <clears throat> you, you get a feeling for kind of your style, which I want to talk about in a minute in the first kind of a, uh, I don't know what, whether it's called. I don't remember whether it's a prologue or whatever, but the, the Whole Foods fish counter. By the way, that's my local Whole Foods. <laughs> uh, and I, I shopped there. there back in that era. Yeah, so you work there for, you, you don't say this until later, but like, you know, part of your immersive, well, we'll get into it now. So like, you, you worked at Whole Foods for two months. Sure. What the hell? Why did you need, to, like, what did, like, okay, a week you're there. What are you getting out of weeks two through eight of being at the Whole Foods. Oh, that's where you really start to settle in. I mean, I do think that the first like three or four days of any experience, you get like 80%, but then you get that extra little bit. I mean, so by no means would I describe spending two months in a grocery store as getting some type of comprehensive, like it was a dil- dilettantish experience no matter what. Um, but I didn't think I could write about the grocery store without having some substantial time in a grocery store on the retail floor. The, the flip side of like the way we interact with it. Uh, so to me, it was just a no brainer in terms of like, I like the immersive approach in general. Um, I think it at, like it allows you to write with a lot more immediacy. It grants you some kind of unconscious permission in, in your audience's brain. 
Um, but but also, I think it just from a really profound level, it subverts a lot of cliches. Like you're walking around with these set ideas of what something is, and then you experience them in real life, and it never matches one to one. Like so, in the Bikram book. Like a lot of people call Bikram a cult. I would never use the word cult because I spent so much time with these people, even if it matches up with like a lot of the descriptors of cults. I would never – like I saw them as fully formed humans who are doing things for wildly complicated reasons. I, You know, Bikram the guru, like you could call him a charismatic narcissist but like i saw what charisma means by experiencing like the the way he would dominate a room or his energy levels right so all of that comes from this up close and personal uh encounter with things and 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 so i think there's something about writing it really refreshes the language if you're experiencing it not writing from a point of abstraction right right let's let's them be more real people yeah because it, 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 I think the instant you separate yourself from something, your brain starts to just push it into categories, at least for me. I, I'm not – I don't have a great memory. Uh, and so I simplify everything as soon as I'm away from it. I, I shrink it down. If I'm in the moment taking notes as it's happening, it's just a lot more blurry. It's a lot more gray. Um, it doesn't fit into these categories. So then if I do – reference something like a cult or I reference something like charisma. I have to put a comma and like 17 descriptors after it to like get at all the different fractured ways that this word that we carry around actually exists in the in the world. Right. But you do like to do that in this book. (laughs) You'll like, you know, you'll throw a little word bomb in and then a footnote and then boom. You know what I mean? It's like a I don't know. It's an interesting tack. Uh, let's, uh, if you are listening live on Patreon, you can call in your questions to Benjamin at 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. And if they're not listening live, uh, John, uh, why don't you tell them how to join the Patreon and what they get and who's coming up uh, in the future? Patreon.com slash cooking issues. We've got a whole, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole great, uh, you know, slurry of guests coming up as always. Uh, Chris Young, uh, Matt Sartwell is going to be coming up, and a couple others that Quinn's working on. It's all going to be great. Uh, awesome discounts with partners like pe- uh, Kitchen Arts and Letters. Hopefully we'll get um, Ben's book here discounted. And yeah, just uh, be part of an awesome community. Join the Discord, Google Maps for restaurant recommendations, all these awesome things. So patreon.com slash cooking issues. Right, and next week we have uh, Abra Barron's, right? A different day from normal? Is that true? That's- Yes, Monday. Yes. Michigan chef who has a new book on fruit. You know, I've never been to Fruit, Michigan. You ever been to Fruit, Michigan, Benjamin? I don't even know its place. Yeah. So there's this like uh, – there's this one part of Michigan that <clears throat> because of the lake can grow very good fruit. So like a lot of our Concord grapes come from yes. there. And it's in the same area where all the furniture people are. Huh. You know, like Herman Miller and all yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird design little – Design and fruit. Yeah. Oh. Fruit, fruit and design. You know, two things that I enjoy yeah. actually – you know, uh, but I've never been to that part of Michigan. I've only been to the other side, you know. I think actually my great grandfather had a farm in that area. Huh. Um, I know there's a lot of tomato uh, grow, growing around there and I, I have know so little about it. But uh, but I think I have been there. It's only in fleeting weird memories of my dad dragging me along to, to on a family trip. Yeah. But, All right. Well, you know, there you go. Well, check out her book, Pulp. If Hope. you're interested in cooking with uh, fruit, I, I just received the book. I haven't read it yet, so I, I can't say anything one way or the other. But she's going to be on the show next week. That's what's going to happen. Fruit's one of those universally good things. I mean, no one says a bad word about fruit. Okay, can I, can I say this? This What you're saying is almost correct in that it is literally designed for us to like it, fruit, right? Not, you know, us meaning everything, right? Yeah. Sugar, right? And we're designed to like it. Yep. There is a huge cadre of people that don't. Or I don't know where it comes into their mind. They don't like cooked fruit. You ever met these people? No, but I would. Uh, I'd have words with them. Yeah, they don't I like would, co- cooked fruit. Certain sometimes, glances. Sometimes it comes out as a as a distaste for pie, huh. and then when you burrow in, you're like, "What is it that you don't like about pie? Is it that it's delicious?" And they're like, "No, it's not that I hate that it's delicious. It's that I don't like cooked fruit." Roast peach, like a like a, yeah. What what's up? I don't know. It's a thing. It is a thing. Huh. If you go out and ask, right. Uh, you will find – eventually you will find that person. Usually cake over pie people, they're, they might just like cake more. Mm-hmm. But, on the other, but they might be one of those cooked fruit people. Got it. Got it. That explains – because there are these people who don't like pies and mm-hmm. I've always – I grew up pie strong. Well, especially uh, with your grandfather or great-grandfather or whatever, yeah. you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I I don't even understand where the problem with pie would begin, but now you've solved nah. a life mystery. No, nah, there you go. Well, I'm here for you. Uh, what were we even talking about? How did we even get there? Oh, we're right. talking about future guests. Yes. Oh, my brain goes... Oh, another thing about Kitchen Arts and Letters where you should buy uh, the Secret Life groceries, the dark miracle of uh, the supermarket. Is it American or not? You're American messing, supermarket. American supermarket. Although really, let's be honest, aren't all supermarkets American in the end? I'm just kidding, but I'm not. They're not. It's a very American invention right up there with the roller coaster t-shirt and jazz. Yeah, right? it's, what about what Aldi did to it after the after the war? Like, Well, they, they put their own little spin on that model and it made it extremely efficient. Yeah, even, it? even less so. Yeah, it's like the pizza effect. They perfected it yeah. and then brought it back to us. So you went to, for the book, to go, we're going to go in circles, but you went to one of their distribution centers in the book. Yes. But was that for an Aldi or was that for it like- It was an Aldi distro. I, I went to a number, so- in the book, getting into distribution centers at that time was pretty tricky. I could have gone on a formal tour of a few, but it was actually hard to get some access there. So I decided I would embed with a trucker um, who would make drops at these, and I could wander around and kind of poke around through that. And so I went to a number of distribution centers when I was driving around with the trucker. Um, but Aldi was the one that's featured in the book, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those stores are – all these are, are depressing, the ones I've been into. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, – With great value. I mean, literally, Aldi – I mean, it's – it's uh, they've got a great model of just like banging out some basics at low price. That is, you know, not the lowest quality. It, they put zero money into advertising, zero right. money into like packaging and marketing. Uh, and that's just straight, you know – pennies over the whatever they're making in, in terms of margin. All right. So this has brought me to a, a couple of things. One, the, the trucker. You brought up the trucker, uh, who is a pseudonym I just found out. Lynn, and how do you, how, how's the pseudonym pronounced? The pseudonym is pronounced Lynn Riles. Okay, Lynn uh, Riles. All right. We can really, it is a pseudonym. Uh, I did, there's a very few pseudonyms in the book, but that was one where I thought if I write about this woman, I could really affect her livelihood. And she didn't want a pseudonym, actually, and really? actually may be angry at me uh, because of that. But I just thought I would not live with – I would not sleep well if I wrote something and got her fired or got her blacklisted or – Okay, well, that's just so interesting. So in, in the – when and then the book opens, it opens with – uh, what one of uh, my uh, Instagram friends described as the most metal description <laughs> ever of of the Whole Foods fish counter circa 2013 or 14, whenever you were there. And uh, again, when I was shopping there and probably buying fish, maybe from you, who yeah. knows? Uh, <clears throat> although, did I buy a lot? Yeah, I bought a lot of fish there. Um, where the, it gives it, kind of an overall view of what the tone is going to be, the description of the smell of this fish counter. And then within that, you're like, oh, here's one of your footnotes where you're like, Bing, by the way, uh, I am, if anything, underrepresenting the smell. So you describe how long is the case? It's like 20 feet long or something like that? Yeah, it's right, yeah, it's right around there. It's, uh, and I, I will s stress again that the, the reason I have mixed feelings about opening that book up with that image because it is 100% real. Um, it is exceedingly gross and it is was intended as a metaphor because I think the fish that we were selling at that Whole Foods was perfectly safe. It right. was clean. The fact that the bottom of the case was dredged with like rotten shrimp and entrails of cleaned fish that we that, that hadn't been cleaned in a month and a half or two months – that there, there was a separation there. And to me, that metaphor of like clean and downy on the surface with this fresh ice that we lay down every day and the fish sparkling and then you just start digging through that to this muck, that was irresistible. Um, but but I also, I don't know how representative, I don't have tons of experience with fish counters. Maybe they're all as gross. Oh, caveat, I have, I talked to some uh, other Whole Foods employees after the book came out, and they were like, yeah, that was a particularly gross fish counter. Um, right, but you take a lot of pains to say, hey, listen, you know, so what What it describes in the book, John, you'll, you'll, this is going to make you kind of queasy as a, you know, current chef. They, they would stand up on metal, like, stands, and then chip down into it to cut, like, two-by-two two blocks of the ice that was two months of ice accumulated, of crush, that was accumulated and, like, kind of glacier compacted into the top into, like, solid ice. But the freezer was on the fritz, so the bottom was kind of watery. 
And they would take these two by two blocks out. And after the first block comes out, you start seeing the filth and the smell permeating out of it. Like is apparently worse than uh, when you went to Thailand to a trash fish processing unit, which you describe as having a smell that is, wait for it, deafening. A smell that is deafening. You can't hear what people are saying because it smells so bad in front of this uh, trash fish. Uh, Disgusting. Th- yeah. It was 90 degrees. Trash fish up to your like mid ankle. Yeah, You're like yeah. wading through rotting fish on the, you know, right off the, the dock. But it's not only 90 degrees. There's also a, literally a furnace in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and so like you're like, yeah, but that smell is somehow not as disturbing yes. as this smell from the right. Bowery Whole Foods, which they've replaced people. They have replaced. Anyway, so it's a it's an interesting way to start the book, but what it l- leads me to, I don't know whether you're going to take this as a, as an insult or a compliment, but um, you don't put yourself as front and center and don't do drugs in the book. But right. it is uh, sp- specifically you say that you're not stoned in in one or two occasions, right. but uh, it seems to me to be kind of. St- it's almost gonzo in a way the journalism you know what i mean like um, yeah i have an affection for the, for for big writers for guys who are not afraid to throw around some big you know like i, I would shy away from hunter s thompson i love him i grew up with him i don't want to i don't want anyone thinking that i'm trying to be hunter s thompson because he's there's only one f-ing hunter s thompson and we you know leave him where he is um but yeah, I have a lot of affection for those guys. And I, I think, you know, I, I love whoever said that the, the opening is metal. Um, I think you got, it's just like a punk song almost. Like you got to get people from the first chord in a book. There are so many reasons not to read in our culture or to read just like two second snippets on Twitter. So if you're going to go, you got to go hard. Like you're, you're going to slow. There, there was a time when you could have a slow burn of a book, and I love those books, but I don't know where America's attention is now for the slow burn grocery book. Like, okay, <laughs> let, let, let's I mean, save that for something else. That's most of them, but uh, yeah. I, mean, I have to read a lot of these kinds of things. Um, but so then that brings me, so, you know, you, unlike a lot of other books, you're present in the book. Unlike a lot of other nonfiction books about this kind of subject that, like I say, I have to read on the regular, you're extremely present in this book. And judging your own judgments, criticizing your own criticisms the whole time, but clearly a character. And you've given yourself permission to be, and this is the one thing that kind of stuck a little bit on me, like kind of brutal to some of your uh, people. So this person with a pseudonym who I can't believe she was mad that you used a pseudonym, you're unbelievably brutal in your description of her cough, like how gross, like yes. the fact that she incessantly talks to you about crap that you don't want to hear. I mean, it's pretty hardcore yeah. and unusual. So like, what is that? I mean, I can't believe she was cool with it and wanted her real name used even despite that. That's a tribute to her, by the way. Well, one, yes, yes. I think I am hard on characters. I think and that really came from the Bikram book where I was, I really wanted to just do like a warts and all portrait of people. And I think I want to be in that book. I was much more of a present character Um, in this book. Like you said, I'm present, but it's not really about me introspecting. Maybe I'm reacting to things to give you a contour, but I'm I'm less present, but I want to be harder on myself than anyone else. But I, I do think there's a lot of bad writing that just kind of hagiography at the end of the day. And, uh, yeah, if we can't call it, call a spade a spade, you know, it's, I, I, I think it, it, it also dignifies this woman, Lynn, or who I call Lynn, um, a little bit to, to know, she has an enormously difficult life. And I think anyone who reads that chapter can, does, cannot come away with, uh, an appreciation of how hard the life of a trucker is, how hard the life of a female trucker is. And then in particular, the work that she's putting in and 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 the care that she's putting into that but if i just write that in a glowing way and i don't include some uh, like obvious honest um reactions to who she is it that it loses its luster it just becomes another thing in airport magazine of just like this like saintly female trucker that i that i followed um and that's not real right so so it is hard it's a hard balance though um i i nobody likes 
what I write about them uh, when they first read it. And some of them don't like it ever. Uh, and it's hard because you spend a lot of time with these people. I always share it pre-publication because I want, I don't want anyone to feel blinded. But no, I'm, I mean, everyone thinks they're going to like it. And sometimes I'll write things that I think are like, on verging on hagiography and I'm sure they're going to love and then they read it and they like the, the description sticks on them or the some representation of what they said with my own editorial next to it sticks and it's it's definitely one of those things you got to have a strong stomach for yeah well the trucking one I think because of that description and like kind of this weird thing where you're like I can't wait to get out of this truck with this oh I was just done. I mean, I was oh, I, I was ready to bolt from that <laughs> chapter. I thought it was going to be fun. I thought I was going to be living my childhood dreams of a tr truck driving, see America, like, you know, Dharma bums on the road. But no, um, it was one, it's a grueling life that deregulation has completely changed the nature of the job from the kind of, um, you know, more more middle class 1970s. Um, but also, this yeah, those was a movie, difficult Those movies woman. you hate, by the way, I love. <laughs> Smokey and the Bandit. I don't, I don't mind Duel. Um, there's there's some good trucking movies out there. Um, but but more, she was a tough cookie. Like, she was not, she, we would never be BFFs in real life. Uh, and I guess there's something fundamentally weird about me writing that up as if we were going to be BFFs. And, and I think something that would shrink her as a as a truly remarkable person, I mean, I, and I have a lot of respect for her. Well, I yeah, that does come through, especially when she comes back in later. And uh, but I think one of the most shocking things, because I had you know heard about slave slave uh, and shrimp, uh, you know, uh, boats in Thailand, and you know, I knew some of the history, not the personal stuff, uh, with you know uh, Trader Joe's, which is one of the main subjects of the book, but. Um, and I knew that, uh, you know, as part of the museum that, you know, everything we get comes by truck, yeah. right? And, you know, you – what's interesting is, is that you would expect that this is going to be a story about – and it's mentioned, right, how much gas is burned and, right. you know, because those reefer trucks are going 100 percent of the time and they're getting – they're poorly maintained. They're getting zero – well, not poorly maintained, but they're still getting much lower than what we say on their on their mileage. And just the, as you put it, rivers of fuel being burned every night. Yeah. But that isn't the story. And I was like, oh, because I was like, oh, that's going to be the story. That's not even the story. I could not believe how these uh, people who work these incredibly long hours are reduced to penury for for uh, for those that don't. I mean, like I'm not giving the book away. She works for a hundred dollars a week. Yes, she gets paid a hundred dollars a week for the week I'm with her and the week before I'm with her. The week before that, she she was. I think taking uh, she was grossing something like one hundred twenty thousand dollars and taking home something like seventeen thousand dollars for the year, um, and she's working seventy hour, eighty hour weeks when she was doing that. Uh, it, it's no, it's uh, it's unfathomable. I think I walked into this book, like I said, thinking this is going to be a book about the grocery store and and uh, this like truly miraculous. Like, I think that's the miracle in the title. Like you walk into a grocery store, we got more options than the greatest Kings and emperors at our fingertips. Uh, it's, it's amazing. You can decide to cook Gordon Ramsay's five spice goose uh, the night before Christmas and go to your local whole foods and get every ingredient you need. But there's just, uh, you know, the book I ended up writing was about all the fat power that goes into that to create that. And that is really a book about labor and a book about, um, the way that labor standards have been degraded because to create that abundance at the prices we expect, um, something had to give and the two places it gives is the environment and the way you treat your employees because that's where you shave the pennies off. Right. And that comes up over and over and over again with the exception of Trader Joe's. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, just the inexorable pressure, monetary and time pressure on the trucking community. And then, you know, as you bring up <clears throat> like – Culturally, it's an interesting group of people because they want – they see themselves in an entirely different light. You know, they, they don't see themselves in the way that most, um, I think, exploited classes would see themselves, which is interesting in a way that I hadn't really thought about before. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I mean, I think – first of all, trucking so big that, it, that making big generalizations about the – is the – uh, biggest employer in the majority of the states uh, is kind of my go-to stat on it. It's so it's such a oh, 
an overwhelming class of people that making big generalizations is hard. But the truckers I hung out with were, you know, right wing radio, a lot, some ex military, um, and there was a strain of individualism in them and a belief in kind of like put your nose down, do the work, and the system will reward you. Meanwhile, they're living in this system that is like bleeding their paycheck, like deduction after deduction, pushing this notion that they're in control of their life through these lease to own agreements that never get that never pay off. They never end up owning their shit. Yeah, because how much does a truck cost? Uh, it's, oh, it's extremely expensive. I, I don't know. I, I get hundreds, the right. Yeah, hundreds. hundreds. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of confluence of that individualism and work ethic with like people who are willing to like mouth it as pieties, but also rip you off at the same time was real, was really powerful. And so you'd have people who felt like they were doing this job to be in control of their lives and any objective observer would be like, you are not in control of your life. You are scraping by barely making it. And like, um, I guess, I guess was very fascinated with that. Right. She didn't even have an RV. It was in storage. She no. lit- was literally she homeless. She was literally living in her truck. Yeah. A hundred percent. And of the that time. was, that's not, I, like I chose her to focus on, be, not because she was some crazy abnormality. Like, so since the book came out, a number of places have picked up on that kind of trucking story. Um, and, they, they, you, 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 you swing a cat in the trucking lot. You'll find someone who's similar to Lynn, right? And well, and and you also take pains to say that you have no actual statistics on this. But um, well, this one you do. Like five percent of the trucking uh, uh, force is women. That's right. And you did not speak to any of them that had not been assaulted, or had not heard like, stories of like their friend being raped. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's an enormously abusive industry for women. I will say some of this may be tr- I mean trucking the pandemic happened as the book was published and trucking got hit the hardest. Um I, I don't know how much of this has changed. I imagine very little, but um yeah, the female the way you train trucking is not a no-skill job. It may be blue collar, but you have to learn you, no one's going to just saddle up into a big rig and get behind the wheel and be able to drive it, be able to back it up. Like that's, you, you have to be trained to do that. And you can't train on some, um, you know, like auto autopilot video game type thing. You have to do it in a truck. And so you need to drive around with your trainer while you're doing that. And because no one's paying for training time, um, you train on the job. And so you go off and do deliveries, live, sleep, eat, work in this truck with you and your trainer. And if you're a woman and you're partnered with a male trainer um, who's probably only been doing trucking himself for six to eight months because that's how fast the turnover in trucking is that you can become a trainer, um, which is itself absurd, um, that the person who's evaluating you, who is responsible for letting people know whether you're going to be promoted is also like sitting next to you sleeping in the same like in the same bunk beds that you're sleeping with it's like it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to right. figure out this is a situation that's ripe for abuse and, and, evalu- it is abuse. and evaluating you and evaluating you and plus you owe money already yeah yeah you know what I mean you don't get into that position unless you owe one of these quote unquote schools money right yeah. But it would be a deeply uncomfortable, even if it was just uh, like trucking is small. It's like a midtown elevator sized. You're like you're sleeping, eating, driving in this thing that's not big. So even if it was just like mixed se- mixed gendered, like for like weeks at a time, like forget the evaluation part. That just adds like extra spice. It, it, it's it, it's just a very difficult situation. And you're you're both very frustrated because probably the job is not panning out the way you thought it was. Did uh, were you able to get anything more nuanced about the coming automation other than uh, uh, they'll pry it out, pry, pry my wheel out of my cold dead hands? I you know I didn't. I, th- that's fascinating to me, and I didn't poke down that uh, except for in amateurish ways. Like I'm I'm as interested in it as everyone else. I th- I don't think the march towards automation will be as quick as people think. I mean, obviously it hasn't. People have been saying we're getting automated cars. You know, since, since yeah. like 2016, 18. Um, but uh, no, I don't know. I, I I have no silver ball there, or crystal ball, silver ball, mm. silver ball would be Spag nice. And ball. Probably worth Spag more. Spag ball. ball. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's get to some before I 
only ask questions that I'm interested in. Let's get to questions that uh, people had. Okay. All right. Uh, Josh Kuhn writes in, any ideas why the quality of produce at my local supermarkets has tanked since the pandemic and not come back? And uh, you had a very interesting point about why Trader Joe's uh, produce is spotty. Maybe it's related. I don't know. Half the garlic I buy now is spongy on the inside and has a musty flavor. I also notice this musty flavor in many apples and yams. I haven't bought fresh green beans in two years because they are simply terrible every time. Um, this seems to be a big picture, picture issue as it is the same at all the places I shop from Walmart to the small local grocer. Interested in any insight you might have on this? Man, I, Josh, I don't know, but I've experienced it. <laughs> You're not alone. I don't, I mean, I, writ large, I can give you the obvious answer, which you've probably deduced for yourself, which is that the supply chains are extremely tight. And so, um, you know, the way the market for produce uh, is set up, it's extremely segmented. So there's like class A, class triple A, um, and, you know, all down the line. So if you, you buy almonds or you buy garlic, there's there's many different segments of quality in that. And I think the mar- as the supply chain is tightened, um, those margins have gotten blurrier. So what was available um, at the highest grade is now includes things that are of a lower grade. Um, I'd say it is different from what I – learned about Trader Joe's, which Trader Joe's has this model that um, essentially relies on high turnover. They short code items. A short code means they buy things that will be going expired soon and knowing that they have such high volume of passionate customers that they will buy them off the shelf in a way that it doesn't expect affect the customer experience whatsoever. Um, I don't think that that's what's going on here. Well, where I think where 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 my mind was drawing a relationship was a different thread of the book, which is about just in time. Ah, yes. And in a similar way that like Trader Joe's is buying only what they're going to sell today, right? Other grocers are are not buying things that are are that, but just in time during the pandemic became a little bit too late. Yes. You know what I mean? And so I think that was one of the big lessons of the pandemic. I mean, essentially, we've engineered the supply chain that was so taut and so efficient. And then any disturbance causes mega breakdowns. I mean, there just isn't the slack to absor- absorb something like a pandemic. I mean, there probably never would be a time when we could totally absorb uh, you know, such a disruption. But the the modern supply chain is is it's just on a ha- it's like a hair trigger. It, it's not meant for disturbances. Um, right. And well, how do you think that shakes out? Because the, the labor market had a kind of a, kind of a different trajectory. So in, you know, in our business, in uh, hospitality, you know, one of the things that uh, I think is the worst is that, you know, uh, workers don't ever know how much money they're going to make. You know what I mean? Mm. On the front of house because, you know, they could get cut at any time mm. or even back of house, right? You, some people – times people get cut, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's very um, – it's one of the – one of the bad things about the industry is this um, idea, which is probably worse the lower down the chain you get, of uh, people just figuring out exactly how many people they need for a particular time. And that has to do with something you talk about of the move from just in time to being just about widgets to treating people like widgets and like, you know, calling them in when you want, and not telling what their schedule is going to be. Yep. But the the pandemic and this kind of rise, this need for workers all of a sudden seemed like it was going to bring the promise of, of alleviating that a little bit, but I don't think it is. I don't know. I just don't, I don't feel, I think, I think it's a blip. I think that like, where oh, they, you like, mean like hero pay or what do you mean? Yeah. Well, or right. any of it, any of it, like, no, that's yeah, that was a total blip. Um, no, I think, I mean, worker issues are, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I have not followed it as closely as I should to be, you know, uh, chattering on about it but the here all the hero pay has been revoked at this point and gone back to business as usual and um i think there there have been some labor since so when i wrote in the book about variable scheduling there has been some in big cities like san francisco and new york dc there have been some laws that um aim to solve that so it may be technically illegal right now to do just-in-time scheduling in new york however the enforcement of those laws is basically non-existent. Um, and I don't think there's any real effort to prevent that uh, in practice. You may not be able to call it that anymore. But if your supervisor says, hey, we don't need you today, go home, 
you're going to be quite the empowered employee to go find a labor lawyer and dispute that. And that's not typically the people who are working uh, front end retail. So uh, kind of part of the same kinds of questions uh, from uh, um, Yes, Ezra. Uh, COVID was a wild time as a grocery consumer for lots of reasons uh, and underscored how important grocery is to our communities. I'm curious if you think the pandemic has changed the industry in any long term ways. Maybe if you write a follow up. Uh, although I, I'm sure you're happy to let it let it go and do something else. But uh, I now tend to shop more directly with distributors in many cases now. And two, I'm lucky to live in Oakland where we uh, have uh, an unfairly incredible number of local or small grocery chain stores that carry extremely high quality products. Most other places I go, it seems like everything is owned by one of the huge chains. What is the future of grocery consolidation? How do we ensure that we're getting good products, both ethically and good quality? We talked about that a little bit, what that means or doesn't mean as supply chains consolidate. Yeah. I mean, look, I'd say those are two different questions. The consolidation issue is huge. We've got Kroger Albertsons merging right now. FTC is is looking at that closely. And I think we finally have an FTC that might give a sh- uh, might care about that. <laughs> Um, and, uh, give a hoot and holler, give a hoot. (laughs) I, I, I do think they, they, they certainly are treating it with, uh, a seriousness that it deserves because this is a big deal when the American grocery industry, I think it's like the top five chains control upwards of 65% of the market with this merger going through, it would shrink it more. They get tremendous tremendous bargaining power. So forget the fact that you consolidate that and there's synergies, which means layoffs. And so, the, you know, your buyers get consolidated. There's, it, it, It's pretty devastating for those two chains um, internally because there's a lot of redundancies when they merge. And that's where the cost savings come. But you create something that has a ton more bargaining power. And that puts a pressure on the supply chain that, like we said, is already whittled down to the bone. It's already in a very fragile place. And when the stores can dictate price like that, it forces their suppliers to take that price out of uh, the people who either who are supplying them with raw ingredients uh, and manufacturing plants or uh, the environment or their labor force. Uh, and it just get it trickles down into ways that are that are not sustainable. And rarely does it go back to the customer. I mean, you see both for Kroger and Albertsons, um, over the course of the pandemic, they kind of spoke with their world. They gave Hero Pay, revoked it, and then gave like two separate one billion dollar. Or this is Kroger, not they, but Kroger gave two separate one billion dollar corporate buybacks um, with kind of the record profits that were coming in through COVID. Because COVID, I mean, to answer the first question in that question, um, COVID changed the grocery industry tremendously in that it everyone was suddenly shopping from home. There was no more eating out at stores, so their profits went through the roof. Um, Did it change the trends and the patterns of the grocery industry? I'd say, I'd argue not really. It accelerated all these existing things. So grocery was already on the march towards automation. It was already on the march towards online retailing. And this, the pandemic was just rocket fuel for those trends, but it didn't change things. And lastly, uh, in from uh, Lizzie Young Booksellers, another good bookseller where you should go buy uh, books, uh, this uh, dovetails into one of the people you follow, um, Julie uh, Boucher. It's fine. Yeah. And she has this product, Slossa, and you kind of talk about how uh, – if you start a small food company, uh, you're lucky if it fails right away when you've only spent a couple of thousand dollars in a couple of months of your life. And Nastasia and I have a story about that, which I don't have time to get into. But Lizzie wants to know, Slaza, did she make it work? And look what you brought us. I brought you some Slaza. Yeah, of course. Uh, not only did it, she she's making it work. Uh, I, I don't think Julie has gone from uh, had a rags to riches story. She was never in rags to begin with, so that would be impossible. <laughs> um, but she is she is out there hustling. She was one of the most remarkable people that I encountered in the book, um, just showing exactly how hard it is for a small entrepreneur to uh, to make it. And so, yeah, I wanted to bring you the fruits of her labor, which All is right. Slossa. I've been curious to try it, <laughs> and we're gonna uh, I'm going to uh, pass it around here. So describe what Slossa is. Slossa is a coleslaw. Uh, meets a salsa. I mean, in name, but actually, it's it's more than just that as a neologism. It's like it's it's kind of like a ch- it has some chutney in it. It's some chow chow. It is very uh, chow chow adjacent. Yeah, it's got some. But the chow chow I had a bigger piece, like corn pieces in it, right? Yeah. So it's it it's a relish at heart, and That's it's a, yeah, it's, a, pr- it's a healthy up. alternative. Nope. It's a healthy alternative to uh, you know just dousing it in ketchup and um, but. I, 
I was more interested in it because if you look at this, it is. I thought I, this is just such a lost puppy dog of a product. I tasted it. I really liked it. I, I decided I would never do uh, something on a product. I didn't want to feature a product that I didn't like. That right. just that's just mean. Um, and so then, how <laughs> taking this product that doesn't look like it fits into the venture funded uh, marketplace and like seeing how it, what it takes to to make it. That I was interested in. All right. Well, we are out of time, Benjamin, but uh, I didn't get to talk to you about eye stalk ablation, which I thought was a fantastic mm. story. I only know about it with lobsters, but like, you know, learning to rub a shrimp's eyeball off so that it becomes pregnant real quick. Great, great story. It doesn't work for humans. Um, no, that we know of. No. Uh, and no one's tested it yet. True. Anyway, True. Good uh, point. There, there <laughs> to are, science. There are millions no one of, out there. Like, you know, it, you need to go get the book uh, so that you can, you know, read about, uh, you know, your trip to the CAFO and how you don't know, you don't know where to be after the CAFO happens. And I didn't get to ask you how the heck you afforded to write this book for five years, you know, on what I'm assuming was never a large enough advance because they never are. But if you ever write a food adjacent book again, come back and see us. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a total pleasure. <laughs> Cooking Issues. Cooking Issues. 